Battle of Red Cliff, Part 8, Romance of Three Kingdoms, Chapter 50. Chu Kalyang foresees the Hua Rong Valley episode. Quan Yu lifts his saber to release Cao Cao. The last chapter closed with Huang Kai in the water wounded. Sao Sao rescued from immediate danger and confusion rampant among the soldiers. Pressing forward to attack the naval camp, Han Tang was told by his soldiers that someone was clinging to the rudder of his boat and shouting to him by his familiar name. Han Tang listened carefully and in the voice at once he recognized that Huang Kai was calling to him for help. That is my friend Huang Kai cried he and they quickly pulled the wounded leader out of the water. <laughs> Then they saw Huang Kai was wounded for the arrow still stuck. Han Tang bit out the shaft of the arrow. but the point was deeply buried in the flesh <laughs> they hastily pulled off his wet garments and cut out the metal arrowhead with a dagger tore up one of the flags and bound up the wound then han tang gave huang kai his own fighting robe to put on and sent him off in a small boat back to camp Huang Kai's escape from drowning must be taken as proof of his natural affinity for or sympathy with water. Although it was the period of great cold and he was heavy with armor when he fell into the river yet he escaped with life. In this great battle at the junction of the three rivers the three gorges when fire seemed to spread wide over all the wide surface of the water when the earth quaked with a roar of battle when land forces closed in on both wings and four battle squadrons advanced on the front when the ferocity of fire answered the clash of weapons and weapons were aided by fire under the thrust of spears and the flights of arrows burned by fire and drowned by water sao sao lost an incalculable number of troops and a poet wrote when wei and wu together strove for the mastery in the red cliffs fight the tall ships vanished from the sea for there the fierce flames leaping high burned them utterly so chao yu for his liege lord got the victory while fire was consuming the naval base of sao sao kan ning made sai chong guide him into the innermost recesses of sao sao's camp then kan ning slew sai chong with one slash of his sword after this kan ning set fire to the jungle and at this signal lu mang put fire to the grass in 10 places near to each other Then other fires were started and the noise of battle was on all sides. Sao Sao and Chang Liao with a small party of horsemen fled through the burning forest. They could see no road in front. All seemed on fire. Presently Mao Chie and Wan Ping with a few more horsemen joined them. Sao Sao bade the soldiers seek a way through. Chang Liao pointed out saying the only suitable road is through the black forest and they took it They had gone but a short distance when they were overtaken by a small party of the enemy and a voice cried Sao Sao stop It was Lu Mang whose ensign soon appeared against the fiery background Sao Sao urged his small party of fugitives forward bidding Chang Liao defend him from Lu Mang. Soon after Sao Sao saw the light of torches in front and from a gorge there rushed out another force and the leader cried Ling Tong is here. 
Sao Sao was scared. His liver and gall both seemed torn from within. But just then on his half right he saw another company approach and heard a cry. Fear not, O Prime Minister, I am here to rescue you. The speaker was Shu Huang and he attacked the pursuers and held them off. A move to the north seemed to promise escape but soon they saw a camp on the hilltop. Shu Huang went ahead to reconnoiter and found the officers in command were Cao Cao's generals Ma Yan and Chang Zi who had once been in the service of Yuan Shao. They had 3,000 of northern soldiers in camp. They had seen the sky redden with the flames but knew not what was afoot so dared make no move. This turned out lucky for Cao Cao who now found himself with a fresh force. He sent Ma Yun and Chang Su with a thousand troops to clear the road ahead while the others remained as guards. And he felt much more secure. The two went forward but before they had gone very far, they heard a shouting and a party of soldiers come out, the leader of them shouting, I am Kan Ning of Wu. Nothing daunted the two leaders but the redoubtable Kan Ning cut down Ma Yan and when his brother warrior Chang Zi set his spear and dashed forward, he too fell beneath a stroke from the fearsome sword of Kan Ning. Both leaders dead, the soldiers fled to give Cao Cao the bad news. At this time, Cao Cao expected aid from Hefei, for he knew not that Sun Chuan was bearing the road. But when Sun Chuan saw the fires and so knew that his soldiers had won the day, he ordered Lu Shun to give the answering signal. Tai Su, seeing this, came down and his force joined up with what with that of Lu Shun, and they went against Cao Cao. As for Cao Cao, he could only get away towards Yiling. On the road, Cao Cao fell in with Chang He and ordered him to protect the retreat. Cao Cao pressed on as quickly as possible. At the fifth watch, he was a long way from the glare and he felt safer. He asked, what is this place? They told him it is west of the Black Forest and north of Itu. Seeing the thickly crowded trees all about him and the steep hills and narrow passes, Sao Sao threw up his head and laughed. Those about him asked, why are you, sir, so merry? And he said, I am only laughing at the stupidity of Chao Yu and the ignorance of Chu Kaliang. If they have only set an ambush there as I would have done, why there is no escape? Cao Cao had scarcely finished his explanation when from both sides came a deafening roll of drums and flames sprang up to heaven. Cao Cao nearly fell off his horse, he was so startled. And from the side dashed in a troop with Zhao Zilong leading who cried, I am Zhao Zilong and long have I been waiting here. Cao Cao ordered Hu Shu Huang and Chang He to engage this new opponent. And he himself rode off into the smoke and fire. Chao Zilong did not pursue, he only captured the banners and Cao Cao escaped. The faint light of dawn showed a great black cloud all around, for the southeast wind had not ceased. Suddenly began a heavy downpour of rain, wetting everyone to the skin, but still Cao Cao maintained his headlong. Flight till the starved faces of the soldier made a halt imperative. He told the men to forage in the village about for grain and the means for making a fire. 
But when these have been found and they began to cook a meal, another pursuing party came along and Sao Sao again was terrified. However, these proved to be Li Tian and Shu Chu, escorting some of his advisors whom he saw with joy. When giving the order to advance again, Sao Sao asked what places lay ahead. They told him there are two roads, one was the highway to South Ealing and the other a mountain road to North Ealing. Which is the shorter way to Chiang Ling? asked Cao Cao. The best way is to take the South Road through Hulu Valley was the reply. So Cao Cao gave orders to march that way. By the time Hulu Valley was reached, the soldiers were almost starving and could march no more. Horses too were worn out. Many had fallen by the roadside. A halt was then made. Food was taken by force from the villagers. And as there were still some boilers left, they found a dry spot beside the hills where they could rest and cook. And there they began to prepare a meal, boiling grain and roasting strips of horse flesh. Then they took off their wet clothes and spread them to dry. The beasts too were unsaddled and turned out to graze. Seated comfortably in a somewhat open spot, Sao Sao suddenly looked up and began to laugh loud and long. His companions, remembering the sequels of his last laugh, said, Not long since Sir Yu laughed at Chao Yu and Chu Liang, that resulted in the arrival of Chao Zulong and great loss of troops to us. Why do you laugh now? I am laughing again at the ignorance of the same two men. If I were in their place and conducting their campaign, I should have had an ambush here just to meet us when we were tired out. Then even if we escaped with our lives, we should suffer very severely. They did not see this and therefore I am laughing at them. Even at that moment behind them rose a great yell. Thoroughly startled, Sao Sao threw aside his breastplate and leaped upon his horse. Most of the soldiers failed to catch theirs. And then fires sprang up on every side and filled the mouth of valley. A force was arrayed before them and at the head was the man of ancient Yan, Chang Hui seated on his steed with his great spear leveled. Whither would you flee, O rebel? shouted he. The soldiers grew cold within at the sight of the terrible warrior Shu Chu, mounted on a bare-backed horse, rode up to engage him, and Chang Liao and Shu Huang galloped up to his aid. The three gathered about Chang Fei and a Mali began, while Cao Cao made off at top speed the other leaders set off after him, and Chang Fei pursued. However, Cao Cao, by dint of hard riding, got away and gradually the pursuers were outdistanced. But many had received wounds. As they were going, the soldiers said, There are two roads before us, which shall we take? Which is the shorter? asked Cao Cao. The high road is the mole level, but it is 15 miles longer than the by road which goes to Huarong Valley. Only the latter road is narrow and dangerous, full of pits and difficult. Sao Sao sent men up to the hill troops to look around. They returned saying there are several columns of spoke rising from the hills along the by road. The high road seems quiet. Then Sao Sao bade them lead the way along the by road. Where smoke arise, there are surely soldiers, remarked the officers. Why go this way? Because the book of war says that the hollow is to be regarded as solid and the solid as hollow. That fellow Chu Kiliang is very subtle and has sent people to make those fires. 
so that we should not go that way. He has laid an ambush on the high road. I have made up my mind and I will not fall a victim to his wiles. O oh, Prime Minister, your conclusions are most admirable. None other can equal you, said the officers. And the soldiers were sent along the by road. They were very hungry and many almost too weak to travel. The horses too were spent. Some had been scorched by the flames and they rode forward resting their heads on their whips. The wounded struggled on to the last of their strength. All were soaking wet and all were feeble. Their arms and accoutrements were in a deplorable state and more than half had been left upon the road they had traversed. Few of the horses had saddles or bridles, for in the confusion of pursuit they had been left behind. It was the time of greatest winter cold, and the suffering was indescribable. Noticing that the leading party had stopped, Sao Sao sent to ask the reason. The messenger returned, saying, The rain water collected in the pits make the ground a mire, and the horses cannot move. Sao Sao raged, he said, when soldiers come to hills, they cut a road, when they happen upon streams, they bridge them. Such a thing as mud cannot stay an army. So he ordered the weak and wounded to go to the rear and come on as they could, while the robust and able were to cut down trees and gather herbage and reeds to fill up the holes. And it was to be done without delay, or death would be the punishment of the disobedience or remiss. So the soldiers dismounted and fell trees and cut bamboos, and they leveled the roads. And because of the eminence and fear of pursuit, a party of 100 under Chang Liao, Shu Chu, and Shu Huang was told off to hasten the workers and slay any that idled. The soldiers made their way along the shallower parts, but many fell and cries of misery were heard the whole length of way. What are you howling for? cried Sao Sao. The number of your days is fixed by fate. Anyone who howls shall be put to death. The remnant of army now divided into three, one to march slowly, a second to fill up the waterways and hollows, and a third to escort Sao Sao gradually made its way over the precipitous road. When the going improved a little and the path was moderately level, Sao Sao turned to look at his following and saw he had barely 300 soldiers and these lacked clothing and armor and were tattered and disordered. But he pressed on and when the officers told him the horses were quite spent and must rest, he replied, Press on to Ching Chou, and there we shall find response. So they pressed on, but they had gone only one or two miles when Sao Sao flourished his whip and broke once again into loud laughter. What is there to laugh at? asked the officers. People say those two, Chao Yu and Chu Kalyang, are able and crafty. I do not see it. They are a couple of incapables. If an ambush had been placed here, we should all be prisoners. Sao Sao had not finished this speech when the explosion of a bomb broke the silence and a company of 500 troops with swords in their hands appeared and bared the way. The leader was Guan Yu holding his green dragon saber, best riding the red hair. At this sight, the spirits of Sao Sao soldiers left them and they gazed into each other's faces in panic. Now we have but one course, said Sao Sao. We must fight to the death. How can we, said officers. Though the leaders may have some strength left, the horses are spent. Chang Yu said, I have always heard that Guan Yu is haughty to the proud but kindly to the humble. He despises the strong but is gentle with the weak. He discriminates between love and hate and is always righteous and true. 
you o prime minister have shown him kindness in the past if you will remind him of that we shall escape this evil sao sao agreed to try he rode out to the front bowed low and said general i trust you have enjoyed good health i had orders to await you o prime minister replied kuan yu bowing in return and i have been expecting you these many days you see before you one sao sao defeated and weak i have reached a sad pass and i trust you o general will not forget the kindness of former days though indeed you were kind to me in those days yet i slew your enemies for you and relieved the siege of baima as to the business of today i cannot allow private feelings to outweigh public duty do you remember my six generals slain at the five passes the noble person values righteousness you are well versed in the histories and must recall the action of yu kong the archer when he released his master si cho for he determined not to use chi chou's teaching to kill chi chou Guan Yu was indeed a very mountain of goodness and could not forget the great kindness he had received at Sao Sao's hands and the magnanimity Sao Sao had shown him over the deeds at five passes. He saw the desperate straits to which his benefactor was reduced and tears were very near to the eyes of both. He could not press Sao Sao hard. He pulled at the bridle of his steed and turned away saying to his followers break up the formation From this it was evident that his design was to release Sao Sao who then went on with his officers when Quan Yu turned to look back they had all passed he uttered a great shout and Sao Sao's soldiers jumped off their horses and knelt on the ground crying for mercy but he had so had pity for them then chang liao whom he knew well came along and was allowed to go free also having escaped this danger sao sao hastened to get out of the valley as the throat opened out he glanced beside him and saw only 47 horsemen As evening fell they reached Jiangling and they came upon an army that they took to be more enemies. Sao Sao thought the end had surely come but to his delight they were his own soldiers and he regained all his confidence. Sao Ren who was the leader said I heard of your misfortunes my lord but I was afraid to venture far from my charge else I would have met you before. I thought I would never see you again said Sao Sao The fugitives found repose in the city where Chang Liao soon joined them he also praised the magnanimity of Guan Yu When Sao Sao mustered the miserable remnant of his officers he found nearly all were wounded and he bade them rest Sao Ren poured the wine of consolation whereby his master might forget his sorrows As Sao Sao drank among his familiars he became exceedingly sad Wherefore they said O prime minister when you were in the cave of the tiger and trying to escape you showed no sign of sorrow now that you are safe in a city where you have food and the horses have forage where all you have to do is to prepare for revenge suddenly you lose heart and grief why thus Replied Sao Sao, "I am thinking of my friend Guo Chia. Had he been alive, he would not have let me suffer this loss." He beat his breast and wept, saying, "Alas for Guo Chia! I grieve for Guo Chia. I sorrow for Guo Chia." The reproach shamed the advisers, who were silent. Next day, Sao Sao called Sao Ren and said, "I am going to the capital to prepare another army for revenge." You are to guard this region and in case of necessity I leave with you a sealed plan. You are only to open the cover when hard pressed and then you are to act as directed. 
the Southland will not dare to lick this way. Who is to guard Hefei and Xiangyang? Qing Chao is particularly your care and Xia Hu Tun is to hold Xiangyang as Hefei is most important. I am sending Chang Liao thither with good aids of Li Tian and Yue Qing. If you get into difficulties, send at once to tell me. Having made these disappointments, Cao Cao set off at once with a few followers. He took with him the officers who had come over to his side when Qing Chao fell into his hands. Cao Ren placed Cao Hong in charge of Yiling and Qing Liang. After having allowed the escape of Cao Cao, Guan Yu found his way back to the headquarters. By the time the orders, others' detachment had returned bringing spoils of horses and weapons and supplies of all kinds, only Guan Yu came back empty-handed. When he arrived, Chu Kaliang was with his brother congratulating him on his success. When Guan Yu was announced, Chu Kaliang got up and went to welcome him, bearing a cup of wine. Joy, O oh General, said Chu Kaliang, you have done a deed that overtops the word. You have removed the empire's worst foe and ought to have been met at a distance and felicitated. Guan Yu muttered inaudibly and Chu Kaliang continued, I hope it is not because we have omitted to welcome you on the road that you seem sad. Turning to those about him, Chu Kaliang said, why did you not tell us Guan Yu was coming? I am here to ask for death, said Guan Yu. Surely Cao Cao came through the valley. Yes, he came that way, but I could not help it. I let him go. Then whom have you captured? No one. Then you remembered the old kindness of Cao Cao and so allowed him to escape. But your acceptance of the task with its condition is here. You will have to suffer the penalty. Chu Kaliang called in the lictors and told them to take away Guan Yu and put him to death. What actually befell will be seen in the next chapter. That brings to the end of the Battle of Red Cliff.